Good morning, John. Good morning. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. So you just came from the Business of Software Conference, correct? I did. Is this the first time you've gone? I think this is my 10th time there. What did you think of it? Oh, I think it was the best one yet. It was a really incredible conference, as always. Met lots of really nice, interesting people and heard lots of great talks. And it was a lot of fun. Boston was beautiful. So I've heard of the Business of Software Conference, but it always seemed more focused on big businesses. What do you mostly get out of it or why someone who's like self-employed like ourselves or like me would be interested in Business of Software? Well, it does have a little bit more of a focus on larger businesses, but there are a lot of indie software developers that are there, smaller entrepreneurs. So while you might assume that they're all large, that's really not true. And a lot of people, I feel like they come on their own from the larger companies. Like you'll meet some people from maybe IBM or Microsoft or Siemens, something like that. But it's not like they were told to come here by their CEO. They kind of were curious about it and came on their own. So mm -hmm. the crowd is maybe a little bit more entrepreneurial than you would assume. So it all depends on what you're interested in. But if you're literally interested in you know, the business surrounding a software company, then it's a great conference no matter what size you are because the concepts pretty much universally apply to every business. Sure, there'll be some stuff that is more focused on what big businesses are interested in, but there's pretty much a talk for everybody. And even if there's not, there's a whole lot of value in talking to the other people there. Because even if you're, it's just you at your company, there are other people there who have been there. In fact, probably most of the people started off with a small company and grew it into what it is today, although that's not universal. So I think it's useful for pretty much everyone. And if you've ever been to a conference like MicroConf, you know, there's overlap in that crowd. The people who go to both, I go to both. So it's definitely not something where you go to as a small business owner and be completely bored out of your mind. So what were your favorite talks this year? Oh, man, that's always a tough question. My friend Matt Wensing gave a talk on how to do forecasting. I really enjoyed that. He's working on a product called SimSAS that I'm kind of indirectly invested in through Tiny Seed. So I like to see him up on the stage. That's a little bit selfish, maybe, of me, but that was really cool. More for the app developers, Caesar from One Second Every Day gave a really great talk about kind of the evolution of his company. Now explain to me what One Second Every Day is. Okay, so One Second Every Day, I guess you could call it a super private social network. In fact, I think its original target was just you. It's like a personal social app, <laughs> if that makes any okay. sense. Maybe it doesn't. But the whole premise of it is that every day you shoot one second of video and the app basically stitches them all together into a basically uh, infinitely expanding video. Like a montage, essentially, of how you've changed every day. Something like that. You could use it that way. What a lot of people do is it's not a montage of themselves, but of their experiences, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, you go on a vacation, you shoot you know, one second of the beach or something like that. Or Very cool. As he pointed out in his talk, some of the most value is actually also filming, since it's private, some of the, your worst moments to kind of be a memento of that. So right. Yeah, I mean, like nobody ever shares pictures at a funeral. <laughs> it's like never going to show sad moments. So yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah, but that might that funeral might be something that was very important to you personally, even if yeah. you didn't want to share it with other people. Yeah. And so having in there makes it... Uh, you know, a more a rich experience when you kind of review what you've done. It's really, so I'd heard of the app before I had friends use it. And after his talk, I installed it. And it actually is pretty addictive. Once you get a few videos stringing together, you see the value. So would you recommend someone like myself who's a self-starter or an app developer to go to a conference like this? And if you do, I guess, how would you prepare for a conference like uh, Business of Software? And this is in Boston, right? Yeah, it's in Boston. They also do one in Europe every year, usually in the UK. Okay. How would you say someone like myself would prepare for a conference like this? Yeah, so the number one thing probably is to figure out what are your goals for maybe the next year or maybe two years, something like that, so that when you go to the conference, you have something to ask everybody you meet, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes total sense. I think that's like kind of the way I prepare for most conferences is kind of looking at who's speaking and who's going and kind of try to network, try to meet with people and things like that. So very cool. Yeah, I definitely need to put that on my list of conferences to look at for next year.
Yeah, I highly recommend it. I get lots of value out of it. Even if there were no talks, I would get a lot of value out of it because it is a meeting point for the kind of people that I think are really fun to talk to, really interesting. And that is value right there. And then, yeah, the speakers are pretty much universally really great speakers. And most of them stick around for the conference. So you actually have opportunities to talk with them after their talk or before their talk, which is kind of a unique thing. That's awesome. Our sponsor this week is Bright Digit. Bright Digit is my company, and we specialize in helping businesses build apps for the iPhone, the iPad, the Apple Watch, and the Mac. I've been building apps for iOS for almost 10 years now. We have an opening for new projects. If you are a company who might already have developers but need help building something for any of the Apple platforms, send me an email and let's see what Bright Digit can do for you. Contact me personally at leo at brightdigit.com. That's L E O at brightdigit.com. And let's see how I can help you and your business. So, John, we met at MicroConf, I want to say like three years ago. And there's a small circle of us iOS devs who go to MicroConf. We've had previous guests like Jane and uh, Alex on the show who are also iOS developers who do small business stuff. And your particular niche is you run a website called Hire an App Dev. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So go ahead. I'll let you introduce yourself and what exactly your special expertise is. And also talk a little bit more about HireAnAppDev.com. So I've been kind of passionate for a while about uh, treating developers well and kind of how they can build their career. So that's kind of where the, the website came from. You know, I'm a iOS developer. That's how I make the majority of my money is by being an employee developing iOS apps. And I noticed that a lot of companies, especially larger companies, have a hard time hiring iOS developers, actually have a hard time even evaluating whether somebody is a good iOS developer or not. The experience is frustrating on both sides. For me, as like a team lead who wants to hire people who are, you know, talented, and also as a developer, you know, I've switched jobs and it can be really hard because you'll go to an interview and they'll ask you some really weird question that has very little to do with 99% of all iOS development. And, <laughs> and you're really wondering, like, who are these people who are, you know, basically rebalancing these binary trees from memory, you know, for their iOS app. Who are these people? I've never met them. And you, but you suffer through these interviews. So it's kind of like these two needs that I have that I feel like probably a lot of other people have, which is trying to find talented people. And as somebody who has a little bit of talent in iOS uh, development, trying to find, you know, a job that treats you well. So what makes particularly hiring an iOS developer a challenge from, say, hiring a web developer or like an Android developer or C Sharp developer or something like that? What do you think is like the biggest challenge when it comes to that? Probably Android and iOS are in the same kind of bucket for this, which is that the people who tend to hire them may not really have personal experience in it, especially if it's a company with a really small team. And even if you do have iOS developers interviewing iOS developers, kind of alluded to this, there's this kind of cargo cult interview style where you ask people either strange puzzles like I interviewed at Intel once and they won they had this like whole scenario about some psychopath who buries people up to their heads in the beach and the water's tide's <laughs> coming in and they have different colored hats or something. I don't remember the scenario now. Like the chip company we're talking. Yeah, about. yeah, Intel the chip company. <laughs> and I was like, this is really fun but also incredibly stressful and I have no idea how this has anything to do with my job as a software developer. And then on the other side you have the people who want you to remember your data structures and algorithms that you haven't used in however many years because you know you can just google it right if you ever need it and most of the time you don't need it yeah i feel like we had the same discussion with alex when it comes to interviews so first of all it sounds like one of the issues is people who do the interviewing have no experience with ios development or swift so there's it seems like that's one separate issue where they like don't understand the particular issues with building native iOS apps. But then on the other hand, you have this massive problem I see with a lot of interviewees where I haven't seen the bury the dead bodies issue, but I kind of understand what you're talking about, where it's like very particular issue that that company runs into 
that is a technical issue that somehow you have no like frame of reference what they're talking about. But at the same time, like you're supposed to be able to bring something to the team. But then there's also and I I think this is more of a problem with bigger high tech companies where they have very, very smart people on their team that they ask the sort of computer science questions, right? Like, how do you sort this particular thing or B trees or who knows what? And I think like unless you're doing some like really writing code close to the metal, essentially like really like I'm going to be managing registers and memory and all this stuff. I think that stuff is applicable, but for 99% of software developers out there, you just find a piece of software or code already out there on Stack Overflow or GitHub or a library, a Swift package, a CocoaPod, whatever to do it for you because it's cheaper and quicker for the company in the long term. I think these big companies do it. Some of them do it for legitimate reasons, but most of the time they don't. But then it's the little companies that kind of mimic that when they have no right to do so. And like, they don't really need to be asking about sorting algorithms and B trees and things like that. When they're just a small company who writes software, like just buy something off the shelf that does that for you. Cause it's going to be cheaper and quicker over the long term rather than asking these developers, like these questions that they're just not going to run into. Does that sound about right? Yeah. I think some of these issues developers may run into, but if you run into it, you look it up and you do some exploration and you talk to right. people. <laughs> there are lots of resources now. And so memorizing this makes zero sense. We have the internet. It turns out that software developers have made tools that kind of have made this less important having these things memorized. That said, you know, you should have an idea of, you know, what tools exist out there. So you kind of right. need to look for, but definitely not to the point of memorizing it. And by wasting time on you know, these crazy data structures and algorithms problems, you're not testing whether people actually know how to build an app. And that's probably the most important thing when you're trying to hire an app developer. Right. Is knowledge of the existing tool set, I think, is more important. Also, proving the ability to learn when new tool sets come along. Swift UI is a great example. Like, it's good that you're an expert at UI kit, but can you pick up Swift UI and understand some of the stuff that goes on? And showing that ability to like pick up new stuff because spoiler alert, technology changes all the time. Like that's right. Medicine or legal, like you're always going to have to stay up to date with like medical journals or legal journals and things like that. You're going to have to stay up to date every year with whatever WWDC puts out. Oh, yeah. And that kind of brings us to the other topic, which is why the heck are so many employers reluctant to basically pay for continuing education for their iOS developers? To me, that's insanity. Have you seen that a lot? Yeah, I've seen that. When I worked at uh, Homeway, which is now VRBO, they basically won't let you go more than once. You know, if you win the lottery. You're talking about WWDC. Yeah, if you win the WWDC lottery and you've been before, they'll basically make you give your ticket to somebody else on the team, which I can't kind of get it. But on the other hand, it makes it so painful, right? Like, <laughs> right. I charge my credit card for sixteen hundred bucks, and I won the lottery, but now I'm being forced to give it to somebody else, and you know, it's crazy. And I've been told before at companies that you know, well, we're not going to pay for WWC, even though you won the lottery. And I basically found another job that would pay for it. It's madness. I think, like, yeah, I've worked in the past at institutions that like. <laughs> training is pretty poor and it's reflected in employees that have been there over the long term. I don't want to be too cynical, but I almost feel like a lot of companies do that because it keeps their developers in the company rather than picking up new skills that they're going to go and quit and go somewhere else with their new skills. I don't know. Like that seems awful. But like at my previous employer, they took us to training. They paid for that and all things like that. They were totally willing to pay for that or books or things like that. So yeah, I think it's really disappointing when a company does that. It almost definitely stagnates the culture in the company when you don't when you don't encourage education and continued learning. Yeah. Well, to put it in a more positive light, if you want to hire a great team of iOS developers and you want to retain them, it's very easy to do by basically making it very public that anybody who works for me, if they win the WWC lottery, we will totally pay for their ticket and their travel expenses. No problem. We'd love you to get continuing education. You know, if you want to go to another conference, CocoConf or something like that, we'll pay for that. We'll do once a year. We'll pay for you to go somewhere and learn new things. It's easy. People want that, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that's one of the issues I've seen in a lot of companies is like a lack of growth. 
And when you don't encourage that, the company is going to fall behind. I mean, that's just the way it is. And to be stingy that towards your employees who you depend on. I definitely know where you're coming from, where I've seen companies that don't like encourage growth and learning and aren't willing to pay for conferences and things like that. I wouldn't say like it's probably one of the top reasons why I've left companies and maybe have worked on my own is the fact that like I've seen these companies where people just stagnate and you get the grunt of it because I've seen people work at companies, work their butt off, train themselves, you know, deal with it all themselves. And then, you know, when a round of layoffs come on, you know, they're going to be let go because they don't have the skills. So they just hire new people who have those skills rather than training their current employees. So I think, yeah, it's really disappointing. What are some other common mistakes that companies make when they hire folks or in the process of hiring folks, I should say? One I see an awful lot, which is mind boggling, is their recruiters or whoever's in charge of the process just has no organization skills whatsoever. So you'll contact someplace and they will talk to you for a while and then they'll never talk to you again. I've had places fly me out for an interview and I never hear from them again. It's like you just spent, you know, if I add up the cost of travel and hotel and the food I ate and your employees wasting their time talking to me, you probably spent $10,000 or something on this interview and you never bothered to call me back to tell me if I got the job or not. (laughs) And you don't respond to email? What's going on? That's really horrible. I've definitely had interview situations where I haven't been contacted back. Do you think it's a lack of organization skills or a lack of priority where it's like, it's not such a priority to contact this person and let them know that they didn't get the position. So let's just ignore it. Or you also have like the problem of the fact that you're dealing with a company as opposed to one person who can make a decision. And especially with a big company, that position that they had put out Looking to hire someone is no longer important to them. And it just gets like let go and dropped from the priority list. And since nobody calls the shots, like we'll just never call John back and let him know that we don't need him for that position because we don't need that position anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. Basically, you're saying it could be incompetence instead of (laughs) or just like not caring. Not caring more than incompetence. Incompetence to me is more of like purposefully not taking care of your emails or not going through your tickets of work to do or your like applications. Whereas I think this is almost like triage, right? Where it's like, who cares about John? He's way down on the list. Like the CEO or some C-level person all of a sudden has this issue that needs to be resolved by HR. Like that's going to be a much more important issue than dealing with some guy who applied for a job. You know what I mean? People tend to be overworked. Like that's more of what it is. And it's like, And maybe not necessarily overworked, but like given too many tasks to the point where like this can obviously be ignored because there's no risk involved if we don't let, you know, contact this person back. Does that make sense? Yeah, there is risk. They just, it's not for them personally. It's for the company, right? The reputation of the company. Yeah. I mean, hopefully people like you are letting folks know that company X are, you know, (laughs) really bad at getting back with people, but the risk is so small compared to other risks because especially an HR person, all they care about is their job at that company and or. And I've seen this a lot, like a lot more than I'd like to admit, but like you have the HR person and you applied the job and then like that HR person that you originally talked to is no longer with that company (laughs) because they were looking for a new employer. So it's like, you know, they just don't place a high priority on applicants as opposed to like either A, finding a new job or B, like dealing with dealing with whatever fires they have to deal with at the current company. That's true. Although to be clear, usually recruiters are not part of HR, or at least they don't have the same responsibilities. So they're usually totally dedicated to recruiting. So are we talking like external recruiters? Or are we talking like even the internal okay. ones? They're not usually a part of HR. They're usually oh, really their own either that or they're compartmentalized like somebody who does recruiting, unless it's a very, very small company that, you know, is like a one person or two person HR type team, like they're never going to be called into some sort of like, I don't know, legal issue or something like Mm -hmm. no that makes total sense yeah they're like a salesperson kind of they're supposed to be dialing the phone and getting people in and you know there's software to help automate this stuff so if you don't want to hire somebody you probably automate it to just where they just click a button and it sends them an email saying oh sorry didn't work out try again yeah totally so let's talk about that a little bit more i want to deep dive a little bit more into automation because i've heard a lot of like complaints about the fact that like companies don't do a good job with like the automation part of applying for positions. 
to where like if you just don't have the right keyword in your resume or like particular things, even though you're a highly skilled developer, you know, you almost have to do like an SEO type thing on resumes. Like there's probably other issues with automation. But what have you heard as far as like some problems when it comes to automation and applying for positions? Well, yeah, I've definitely heard about the kind of whether it's automated or manual, like the issue of not having exactly the right keyword, right? Like, you know, maybe you're looking for somebody who has Rx Swift experience or something like that. And instead of using Rx Swift exactly, they basically say reactive Swift or reactive Objective C or something or reactive Cocoa or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Or some competing product that, you know, is concepts are similar enough that you'd pick it up, right? Yeah. You hear about this stuff all the time. As a employee, the temptation is, right, you just fill up your resume with all these keywords, which is probably, it's okay, but probably not the best strategy for you because you want the resume to present a good story to a human too, mm -hmm. the one that you intended for. So, you know, if you're worried about that, actually the best tactic is to try to route around the recruiters if you can and find an employee at that company who basically can get your resume in the right hands. Are we talking like doing some LinkedIn research? Yeah, you can do LinkedIn research or if it's something like Apple, right? If you're an iOS developer, you probably know somebody at Apple. And if you yeah, don't, right. a great way to meet one is to go to WWC and spend all your time in the labs, right? You'll meet tons of really nice people who work at Apple, really smart people and you know, there you go. Now you know somebody at Apple who, you know, can maybe get your resume into the right hands. But the same thing is true for any company. If a company is in your town, you can figure out a way to meet somebody who works there, right? And get your resume mm -hmm. directly into their hands. Yeah. Now it's not perfect, right? Nothing's perfect, but that's probably a better strategy than worrying about the keyword thing. Yeah, I sigh because I find that like super difficult. So like I typically do contract work, right? But part of that is doing the footwork, right? Of like actually yes. talking to people and meeting people more so than expecting any sort of like application process to help with that. <laughs> I can say it, totally I agree with that. And the problem is it's a long process, right? I mean, that's just part of it. You have to like build trust. And that's right. You can't totally just ask agree. people. Yeah. And, you know, provide value and things like that in order to like show that you're worthy in a sense. I think that might be not quite the right word, but that you're a genuine human being who's interested in them and shares similar common interests and goals. There we go. Yeah. Thank you. Worthy was not the right word. I was trying to think of it as like, yeah, worthy, like, uh, that's not, you're not trying to be king. Yeah, I agree. And also, you can do this online, right? There is a great community of iOS developers on Twitter. Like, I think I have like a list that has hundreds and hundreds of iOS developers in it. And I, I basically filter that list and look at it every day. And, you know, people are talking about a lot of different things in this group of people. So if you're at all interested in getting a job at a different company or something like that, a great place to start is by interacting with these iOS developers who are on Twitter and, you know, jumping in their conversations and starting relationships with people. And then would you say it's more than worthwhile on Twitter, especially when it comes to iOS social circle than it is on LinkedIn? I can't say for sure. I feel like LinkedIn is more about me, 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 me than it is about collaboration. Mm, interesting. OK, I only say LinkedIn because when push comes to shove and you may disagree with this and I'm interested if you do. But I think when like push comes to shove, like. LinkedIn is going to have more of that business crowd and like folks that are actually going to pay you in a sense or hire you as opposed to like your fellow iOS dev who like doesn't really have that decision making power. That does make sense. And there's oh. definitely truth there. But those people who are doing the iOS development work, they'll know about jobs at those companies and they'll also know who to put your resume in front of. So there is that. But yeah, you can get a relationship directly with a decision maker at a place that might contract or employ you on LinkedIn, then that's great. And I think that's a worthwhile relationship too. It's just, um, well, LinkedIn, I think, is very focused on uh, the career side of things. No, I totally agree with you. I'm not disagreeing with you at all on that. I think it's just like, yeah, you you have a different social circle on each of them. And going to in-person stuff for the sort of decision maker, businessy people is probably more valuable than LinkedIn, would be my guess. Oh, like meeting them in person or emailing them? Yeah. You know, if there's somebody, well, like Business of Software is a good example, right? If you want to do mobile contracting work and, and you went to Business of Software and you present yourself as a mobile developer, chances are somebody there might be aware of somebody who's looking for 
contracting now with Shell, but I mean, certainly that's how I got my first consulting gig is I was a business software and I told everybody I was looking for a new iOS job and somebody sent me an email and said, hey, my friend here needs an iOS developer on contract. And I said, great, I can do that. Yeah. And a lot of it like takes me back to like the difference between going to a meetup and like going to a business conference is the fact like just going to a meetup, usually find people who are your peers who don't have like that decision making power and are more there to learn as opposed to like actual business networking where you're finding people who are looking for developers because you don't commonly run into folks like that. But I think like the power of Twitter is being able to like actually help people in the community. And I think that really helps build your reputation amongst others is being able to provide something valuable when it comes to that. So what do you think are like some skills that companies really should be looking for when they're hiring iOS devs? Or what would you say are like the top three or top five skills they should be looking for? The number one skill is, can they actually write code that goes into an app? It's surprising how many places do an interview for an iOS or mobile developer, and they never look at any of this person's code. One time at um, one of my employers, I think we had, mm, let's say, six or seven people interview somebody for a mobile development role. And... You know, at the end, you have the little roundup where everybody sits around the table and shares what they think of the person. And everybody in that room was like, yeah, we should hire this guy. He's really good. And he went around the table and came to me and I was like, no, I don't think we should hire this guy at all. And everybody looked at me like, really? Why? And I asked the group, like, well, how many of you had him write any code at all? People were like, well, no, not just some white sword stuff, or whatever. And he's like, well, I did. And he gave up. Now, are you thinking specifically like having a coding test or portfolio? What exactly do you think is the best way to decipher that? I won't say it's the best way, but typically the companies I've worked for or worked with will have a coding challenge, which is designed to take about an hour. So something, when I say an hour, about an hour, I mean like really about an hour. If you're trying to hire somebody, you don't want to give them this massive homework problem to do, right? Yeah, I've seen that quite a bit. <laughs> so it's literally like a one screen app where I'll find like an API, an open API that's like well documented, isn't super buggy. And I'll actually try to write the app myself, make sure it takes, you know, about an hour. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I try to in inject, a when I do it, I try to inject a little humor or something in there. So it's not completely boring and dry, you know. Or makes, you know, takes away the nervousness of it. Yeah, let's you hook up the simple API, show basically a table view or something like that. Pretty much your bread and butter iOS app, right? Get data off the internet. You don't need to worry about a database or anything like that. Just go get it. Show me a list of whatever the doodads were in the API. So you start off with that because most of the places I've worked, you'll get a fair number of candidates and you don't want to fly them all in or you know, have them all in the office. So you kind of go through that and you screen down to maybe three, four or five people that you actually want to bring in and talk to. And what I like to do is basically take the code they just wrote and then have them make a small change to that code, you know, while you sit next to them in the room and just talk about it. Something really simple, like add a button or whatever. Really, you just want to make sure that the person actually knows how to use Xcode at the most basic level. And then after that, you can have you know, higher level conversations about this, that, the other thing. But you really do need to make sure that you're hiring somebody who's who's done this before, right? Yeah, I think that's so true. Like, I think they like liked the guy. They didn't realize to actually like see some of his code. So you would say like doing a coding challenge more so than like a portfolio because then, I don't want to say they can lie on a portfolio, but technically you're not actually seeing them. And then as far as like the coding challenge, if they don't complete it within that time, do you consider that a complete failure? Or are you more like, I just want to see how this person works. And if they've run into common issues and being able to work through those, is that correct? Yeah, that's basically, I'm not going to time them during their coding challenge that they took home and worked on. If they spend five days on it, that's fine. I'm not going to ask them how long it took them or anything like that, or make them videotape themselves. No, the whole point is just to have a little bit of code that they wrote for something that's pretty straightforward, right? and see what it is. Like, let me think of like something that's really common. Like a good example is, do they just force unwrap all their optionals in Swift? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
That that is a very good example. Yes, that's a great tell to me because right. you're doing this pretty simple application. If you just have exclamation points everywhere, I call that the please crash operator. <laughs> then I kind of know something a little bit about your coding style. Yep. That makes total sense. But if I had made a very elaborate coding challenge, took hours, it's going to be really hard to know where to draw that line because I gave this person a massive homework problem and they've got their day job and maybe kids or family yep. they're taking care of. Like, yep. So I think it's good to aim for something that's really small, short, simple, gives the person an opportunity to express themselves in some way so they have fun. And some of the patterns that they use and things like that and just kind of see how like how sloppy are they, how they, are they. Yeah, that makes total sense. Cool. Is there anything you want to mention before we close out? I don't know. I could go on for hours like this. <laughs> I guess I'll say that no matter what side of the table you are, when you're trying to hire or be hired as an iOS developer, treat people well, like treat them like humans and, you know, treat it like a relationship, even if today, right now, it may not work out. Yeah. Because in the future, like, Everybody's only getting better at their job and everybody's only going to need more iOS developers, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. And I think like it goes back to what I was saying earlier, like with a big corporation, nobody wants to take like full on responsibility for an applicant. So everything just falls by the wayside. And it's a shame. Exactly. Yes. These are billion dollar companies, hundred billion dollar companies, I guess trillion dollar companies now. <laughs> and you know, they can't bother to send email to people. That's I think a, a huge hazard for you if you're one of these large employers, because I know I always have second thoughts applying at a company that's known to behave like that because, you know, I just want a, a good job. And I'm, am I going to really risk my time, invest all this time and then not even hear back? And yep. that creates yep. other problems. Yeah, I totally agree. Because then you're like, why am I writing this ginormous cover letter and telling them how wonderful they are if they're not going to spend five minutes reading it? It's like, yeah. Well, or they fly me out and I think, oh, I'm going to get an offer for sure. And I never hear back. And I have other offers coming in. And like, do I, <laughs> do I try to delay them? What do I do? Like, it's an investment for me that, you know, other people may not think that it's worth it. And so you'll miss out on people. And that's too bad. Yeah, this is an awesome topic. I'm glad you came on to talk about it. We'll definitely, we'll have to have you on again. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was great talking to you. Do you want to talk a little bit more about um, hireanappdev.com and how it works? So it's pretty simple. Basically, there's two sides to it. There's basically content for people who are hiring app developers, and there's content for people who are app developers, kind of on topics like negotiating, how to prepare for phone screens and job offers, and how to think about your career and how to advance your career, tips on going to WWDC. And then there's basically a job board that I'm slowly trying to you know, bootstrap into being a real job board for iOS developers. And uh, I have a Twitter account, Hire an App Dev, and basically I'm sending out basically links to the content, retweeting iOS job opportunities and other kind of career relevant uh, information. Yeah, it's an awesome website. There's definitely a lot of not just the job board, but like there's a lot of great articles on there if you're looking at getting help getting hired or hiring, you'll definitely want to check that out. How can people get a hold of you on Twitter? Hire an app dev is the, probably the best way. I'm also on at windaddict, W-I-N-D-A-D-D-I-C-T, where I talk about pretty much everything that's not iOS careers. <laughs> that's my personal one, so you can follow me or DM me there too. Awesome. Well, thank you again, John, for coming on the show. It was great to talk to you. If people want to get a hold of me, I'm on Twitter at Leo G. Dion. You can also follow my company address at Bright Digit. And I'm also on LinkedIn and Instagram as well. Thanks for joining us and we will talk to you next time.